Hi friends, today I have something extra special for you in the Summer Audio Blog guest podcast series. Today's guest podcaster is Adrienne Fries. She has been a previous interview guest on this podcast, and I'll make sure to put Adrienne's past interview with me down in the show notes. But Adrienne has recently begun a classical education podcast, exploring the art of teaching and learning. And she has a special exclusive Patreon community where she gives extra bonus content, and she's actually sharing one of those pieces of bonus content with us here today. As you listen to this audio, you may be able to tell that she was giving a presentation online with video slides, and that is available to her patrons. But if you have ever wondered about what exactly is classical education, what is the trivium, and how do we teach using the trivium, this is going to be the episode for you. Check the show notes to find out more about Adrian. Well, if you've been around here for any length of time, you know how much I love including poetry and other beautiful memory work in our family's homeschool day. But if you've wondered what are the best morning time poems to include, well, I have a free printable for you. Head to humilityanddoxology.com slash 100 morning time poems, and you'll get to download a list of 100 of my favorites. And then be sure to come back and let me know which ones your family has enjoyed. Hi, all. Hey, this month I decided to touch on the trivium and uh, for our Patreon members. And I hope this is a helpful instructional video. It won't be too long, just a few minutes. And it's a summary of pretty much what I put in the newsletter this month, in case you didn't get the newsletter or haven't read it yet. I want to just go through some basic parts of the trivium and then walk us through what the trivium looks like in lesson plans. So in a nutshell, the trivium is grammar, logic, and rhetoric, which are the three arts of words that make up the trivium. These are the first three of the seven which establish the seven liberal arts. So the other uh, four would be the quadrivium, which is arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. But we're going to focus on the trivium, and I want you to be thinking about how they are the arts of words or the arts of language um, as we walk through um, perhaps a new and different way of thinking about the trivium uh, than what, you're, we, what you've maybe heard or learned. So what is the trivium? Um, some modern interpretations uh, we have heard in the last 40, 50 years are that it had, uh, is stages of learning. And in this interpretation, um, the neoclassical or the new classical educators speak of the trivium as stages. Um, they also talk of them as being tools of learning. They envision a classical education that provides intellectual tools to children as they grow from unintelligent to intelligent beings. And the idea of this trivium as tools or stages, however, would not have occurred to ancient, medieval, or even 19th century educators because Dorothy Sayers had not yet written her essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, which has had a profound influence on most classical schools today. Before Sayers' uh, essay, no school of educational philosophy thought of the trivium as tools or as developmental stages of learning. Now, as formal subjects, you may primarily know them as standalone subjects, the structure of language, the art of reasoning, the art of persuasive speech and writing. Together, these signify that a person has mastered a language. So we were that would be grammar, logic, and rhetoric. This is true, and it is part of the tradition of the liberal arts that they are subjects. But there's more to understanding the trivium, and we need to look at how it is, in fact, an art. And in fact, a large struggle for schools that divide the trivium as grammar for K-5, logic for 6 through 8, or rhetoric for high school are at a loss often for how to incorporate the arts of logic and rhetoric for K through 8. So historically, the ancient and medieval educators used two words to describe the, describe the trivium of grammar, dialectic or sometimes logic, and rhetoric. The first is arts. In Greek, techni, 
or in Latin, eres. The second is scantia, a word which denote, denoted not just what would we call today science, but any definite set of things that you know. An art is something you do. A science is something you know. So historically, the trivium is both. But for today's purpose, we will just focus on the trivium as an art. The root of this word art is denoted not just in painting, sculpture, and music, but also in any skill, craft, or power. It describes an active engagement with something, not theoretical knowledge or scantia about something. Remember, an art is something we do, and a science is something we know. So we're going to look at how the trivium as a skill-based approach, or an art, actively engages both the student and the teacher in any and all subjects and all grades. The trivium as a way of learning and teaching. The, the trivium in Latin means road or way. It's a path. So the trivium is the foundation of all learning because without language, we cannot learn anything. We must be able to first identify and name things. We can name things by words and by numbers. The trivium is the way of learning language, and we do this through pictures, words, and numbers. But remember, even numbers are names. Everything starts through language. So think about the subjects that teach using numbers. Do, do not limit the trivium as an art of teaching English. It is the art of language. Language can be words, but numbers are also a language. So we can incorporate the arts, we can incorporate the arts of the trivium in math, science, and music. In fact, it can be incorporated as a way of teaching and learning anything. So if we think of the tri trivium as a path for learning and teaching, if it's a way of instruction, then we can incorporate grammar, logic, and rhetoric in anything. It can become the foundation of our pedagogy, and in fact, it should. I'm going to pull up each part of the trivium. The grammar is the instruction mode where you introduce a new concept or idea. It's actually a lot more than that, but this is very basic. Dialectic or also logic is the instruction mode, allowing inquiry-based discussion, thinking aloud, talking about, and working through a problem. And rhetoric is the instructional mode, allowing students to create a response. They produce something that shows comprehension. So in the grammar way or mode of teaching, we assign a word to something and then the students can apprehend it in such a way that we can engage with it in order to learn about it. In this grammar mode, you are giving students material to acquire new information or new knowledge, and it is often attached to previous knowledge. So there can be something, some scaffolding in the grammar mode of instruction. During the dialectic or logic mode, we give students enough information to wrestle with. This gives students plenty of time to map out their mind, what they have just learned in their mind. This, they do this through thinking, through asking questions like the boys in the painting you see here, they're thinking and the teacher is available to them for when they need to ask questions, but the teacher is giving them plenty of time to contemplate in this, in this uh, uh, mode of instruction. Reading and narrating and Socratic seminars also can fall in this category of uh, the trivium and the dialectic. During this phase, the teacher is really serving as a coach. In the rhetorical mode, the teacher is giving students opportunities to enlarge their understanding by responding through seminars, projects, deeper discussion questions that are more rhetorical in form. This also allows for a more creative expression moment for students so that they can take time to process in their own way and then express what they have understood through any manner of activities. Ultimately, rhetoric as a mode of learning gives students opportunities to improve in eloquence and wisdom which are important goals for rhetorician in good communication. But as a pedagogy, this approach embodies the spirit of classical education. It allows students to experience the art of thinking, the habits of reflection, communication, and expression. It allows teachers to implement the arts of language in every subject, thus making the trivium the foundation of good learning. So the, the trivium as modes of learning or integrative faculties of learning for all ages. Let's kind of break this down in, in what it looks like for the student. So we talked about the modes of instruction from the teacher. Now let's talk about the mode of learning on the side of the student. Um, these are the things the student is doing. 
in the grammar mode of learning, the student is gathering information, learning something new by way of observing, experiencing wonder, ordering it, looking for it in transcendental nature to discover its truth, goodness, and beauty, and developing a poetic imagination towards understanding something, learning to recognize things that are worth imitating, exposing children to what is good and true and beautiful helps them to learn to recognize that and learn that it's worth imitating. So the dialectic and logic is where the students are internalizing information. They're learning through interacting, encompassing wonder-filled poetic thoughts and ideas. They're developing the art of dialogue and thinking about things worth imit imitating. And they're even having opportunities to use deductive reasoning and figure things out. And I've seen children very young do this. Um, I was teaching some students nature study and uh, I had given the children leaves from specific plants and trees in the, in the yard of the church we were at. And I, we studied them carefully and I, I had them tap into their senses. I said, smell the, smell the leaf, touch it, feel it, use some adjectives to describe what it feels like. Um, what do you notice about it? Does it have a uh, how would you describe belief in, in the kids used adjectives and, you know, throughout words like rough or smooth or um, bumpy, um, prickly. Anyhow, so then I told the kids to take their leaf outside with their partner and find the plant or tree from which it came. And these two children who were, they're around seven and eight years old, they took their leaf and we had about five, five different trees on the property that were from that exact same, that leaf was, was from one of those trees. It was a, I think a black oak, if I can remember properly. And I, they were going from oak to oak. And I was wondering why they were just jumping around from every oak tree to every oak tree. And then they went, they came back and they said, Mrs. Freeze, we found which tree it came from. And I said, well, how do you know? And they said, well, we, we looked at all the other oak trees that were the same kind of leaf, but we noticed that this particular leaf must have come from that tree because it was shaped more like the oak leaves on that tree and the texture was more like the ones on that tree and less like the ones on the other oak trees. Even though they were the same kind of tree, the children were able to use deductive reasoning, which is logic at six, seven and eight years old to determine which tree their leaf came from. So we don't need to wait until students are middle school to formally give them opportunities to develop um, deductive reasoning, which is in the logic mode of thinking and learning. And in the rhetoric, applying information, rhetoric looks for its transcendental nature to imitate and produce that which is good, true and beautiful. Learning how to imitate requires students to refine their affections towards the beautiful. And remember in the grammar mode, they're recognizing things that are beautiful. They're being exposed to them. And in the dialectic, they're thinking about these things and then in the rhetoric, they're actually refining those affections and they're able to defend poetic truth and imitate the true, the good, and the beautiful. So students imitate in, in mostly the grammar and the rhetoric, um, but the, 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 the type of imitating and the, and the level of imitation they're doing is refined in more in the rhetoric mode of, of learning. Okay, so when we start a new lesson, a lesson plan will often include a section called a warm up or an intro or they'll have a bell ringer. These are simply just templates that a lot of teachers use or are required to use by their school leader. And they're simply to give the teacher a place on a lesson plan to jot down what activity or conversation they will do to open up the new lesson and to introduce a new topic. And then they'll kind of walk through into the body of the main lesson and then they'll have the conclusion. So it's just kind of an outline that teachers will often use. And they can look different from school to school. Um, but I wanted to show you where each part fits within this part of the lesson. So in the warm up and intro, typically that's where the grammar instruction mode is going to happen. Not always, but that's typically where the bulk of it will happen. And then in the body of the lesson, the dialectic is more common to happen there where you're allowing a lot of inquiry-based discussion, thinking aloud, talking about working through a problem or reading a story and narrating. Um, in rhetoric, in this instructional mode, uh, the student is creating a response. So some good ideas for classical teachers um, 
can include asking the students to narrate what they read from perhaps homework the night before. Um, and that could be in the warm up mode. And then look, perhaps for math class in the grammar warm up mode, they might, um, um, like in a math class, they might come up and uh, demonstrate a math solution that is going to bridge perfectly into a new concept. Or um, you could even have a picture study for students to look at that would bridge a discussion. Um, a history teacher that perhaps is going to discuss the Declaration of Independence could warm up the lesson with uh, the painting by John Trumbull, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And so that could be like a five or 10 minute intro to the, the formal body of the lesson. Um, there's many things that you can do to introduce a new concept and engage, actively engage the students to prepare them for that new concept. And then in the body of a lesson, this section of the lesson plan can include multiple activities such as lecturing, Socratic questioning, imitative writing, um, discussion, oral report, small group work, etc. The dialectic mode of the trivium works great for the body of a lesson. While lecture-based instruction does have its benefits, be careful not to limit yourself to lecturing. Um, and when you do prepare a lecture-based lesson, be sure to engage students frequently by asking them questions and having a dialogue with them throughout the lecture, asking them to narrate what you just said, um, making sure you're keeping them actively engaged. Um, when you create a lesson, review it and remember that questions are often better than statements. It is always a good idea to include a few example questions within a lesson plan so that you're prepared. I do suggest narration as a lovely way to conclude uh, a lesson because it is a type of rhetorical response. Other rhetorical responses can include having them write or create something that is responsive to show understanding. Perhaps in math class, you could have the students do a problem based on the new concept and then ask a few students to come to the board to demonstrate how they got the answers. This is also a great way to conclude a lesson and can potentially help a student who is still struggling with a new concept. To see it presented from another student can, can allow them to see it a different way of thinking. So um, in this slide, I wanted to kind of show you side by side, the teacher role on the left and the student role on the right and what's happening as the teacher is in the instruction mode, introducing a concept, the student is acquiring knowledge and apprehending. In the dialectic, while the teacher is asking questions, allowing the students to think aloud, perhaps even having a lecture, the students are analyzing, mapping, questioning, and structuring this idea in their mind. And in the rhetorical mode, um, the teacher is allowing the students to create a response and the student is creating active work. So in presenting these slides, I just completed the grammar mode of giving you new information. I did this didactively, which is direct instruction or lecture, but this is only one way to teach and you must know your content well to teach didactically. There are many ways in which you can teach classically, and these are part of a much larger, larger discussion on the various methods that we can incorporate for classical instruction. But my point is that if the curriculum incorporates the trivium as an art and not as stages of cognitive development, students are then continually building skills, the skills of imitating, thinking, and communicating. The trivium as an art builds skills for humans to improve the art of language this is how we learn at all ages and in all subjects of learning. Once we understand this, we can expand on how the trivium is also a mode of learning and as a curriculum. These are ideas that I discuss at professional development sessions for teachers. I hope this helps to create a path by which you can activate the trivium for all students. Understanding this basic principle can transform an entire school into the beauty of classical education and help both teachers and students flourish to their full potential. And this month, the newsletter that I sent out includes a trivium-based lesson plan as an example. So I hope this was helpful. And you can email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com if you have any questions. And uh, thank you for your support. We are so help thankful for it. It really is helping to um, keep the podcast going. And we look forward to giving you more um, short little tutorials each month. And also, if you are a friend of The Great Conversations, we will have a once a month um, dialogue with you uh, talking about all kinds of interesting things. Um, I think it's the second Tuesday of every month, and we hope that you can join us and uh, watch your emails for the notifications and the Zoom, um, the, the Zoom inv invitations for those meetings. Thank you.
Thanks so much for listening to the Homeschool Conversations audio blog series. I'm so thankful for each of the guests who are sharing their ideas with us this summer. Check the show notes to find more resources from today's guest. And would you please take a moment to leave a rating and review for this podcast in your app? It really helps other homeschool parents find the show. Would you like a copy of my free homeschool planning guide? Head to humilityanddoxology.com slash homeschool dash planning dash guide or check the link in the show notes for this episode. I'm busy recording more scintillating interviews for season six of the podcast. But in the meantime, there are so many fabulous episodes you can catch up on this summer. Check today's show notes to see this week's podcast replay suggestion.